Hello, everybody. Welcome to Working Class Hollywood. Very quickly before I start the podcast, I have a small favor to ask of you. At the time of this recording on iTunes, the podcast has 44 ratings. 44. I want to get to 50 by the end of the week. I want 50 ratings on iTunes. It's very easy to do if you haven't done it already. If you're listening on your phone, you just go to the home page of the podcast and then you just scroll all the way down past the episodes to where it says ratings and review and then there's a thing there that says tap to rate. You click on the empty stars. If you're on your computer, go to the home page of the podcast, click on ratings and reviews and then right there it'll say click to rate and you can you can fill in the number of stars that you think the show deserves. And that'll be your rating. So if I can get to 50 ratings by the end of the week, I will be very happy. It'll make my week. So please just go onto your phone or your computer and just rate the podcast. Very simple. All right. Thanks for listening. Here's the show. Welcome to Working Class Hollywood. Conversations with people that make the movies, TV shows, and entertainment you love. If you're looking to break into or move up in the entertainment industry, or you're just a fan of content and want to hear about how it's made, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Jeremiah Smith. Midway through your very first race, and it happens to almost everybody, you want to quit. It's too hard, people are screaming. It's almost impossible, and you just feel like there's no way that you're going to be able to make it through an entire season. By the end of that first season, you can't wait to do it again. My guest today is Mike Miller. Mike works for a company called ATS, or Alpine Training Services, and they build the sets and stunts and obstacles for American Ninja Warrior, Amazing Race, and Big Brother, and plenty of other shows. Before Mike had that job, he was a challenge producer in reality TV for a long time. He worked on Hell's Kitchen, Big Brother, Amazing Race, and he was the guy that was creating all the cool games, stunts, obstacle courses, all the challenges that the competitors on these reality competition shows were playing every week to try to win their bonuses, avoid elimination, etc., etc. Mike is a super cool guy. He's got great stories. He goes into a lot of detail about the amazing race and the production on that show and what it takes to put it together. It's super fascinating. I had a lot of fun talking to Mike, and I think you are going to enjoy my conversation with challenge producer Mike Miller. Hi, Mike. Hey, Jeremiah. How are you? <laughs> Good, man. Thanks for letting me come. We are in Mike's office, uh, which he just gave me a little tour of, and it's like a Willy Wonka factory for uh, challenges and stunts and obstacle courses and stuff. So, Mike, why don't you just introduce yourself, tell me uh, who you are, what your role is here, and what you do. Okay. My name is Mike Miller. I'm the executive vice president in charge of international operations and business development for the ATS team. Uh, ATS stands for Alpine Training Services, but it's been a while since we've done any Alpine training for anybody. So what does ATS do? We are best known for designing the obstacles and courses for American Ninja Warrior and the Ninja Warrior franchise all over the world. Uh, We also do shows like Ultimate Beastmaster on Netflix, uh, the upcoming Titan Games, which premieres tomorrow night. Uh, TKO, which was on CBS. We also do the big rigging backyard stunts on Big Brother and any of what they call the big wow stunts on The Amazing Race. So, and this is like American Ninja Warrior. We're talking about like the big truss with the like, you know, the the hanging things and jumping over the moats and the, the, the warped wall and like all that stuff. Like you guys actually design and build those those features, those obstacles. That's correct. We, uh, we, we start... About 10 months before the show goes into production, we start coming up with new obstacles, come up with anywhere from 30 to 60 new obstacle ideas for every season. Uh, In the first few months, that kind of gets whittled down to about 15 to 20 that are implemented throughout the season. And you're not the production company for the show. You're like contracted right. by the production company to build the the set, essentially. That's correct. Right? Yes. Uh, um, and I, I want to get into what this job is a little later, but let's start from the beginning, I guess, because you have a long history 
of working in reality TV as a challenge producer, right? That's correct. So how, where are you from originally and how'd you end up in LA? Uh, originally from Washington, DC. Lived in a bunch of different places before I ended up in Los Angeles. Came out here after I graduated from the University of Michigan in 1998. Mm-hmm. Uh, graduated at the age of 32. <laughs> uh, I, went, I went back a little, went back to school a little late. You're super, super, super senior. <laughs> That's yes. Um, and uh, kind of fell into reality TV or reality competition TV right at the very beginning. Did you have a career before you like? Went back to school and got into TV. Uh, waiting tables, bartending, um, sometimes going on the road with rock and roll bands. Yeah, uh, was living in Cincinnati, at Ohio, at the time, and kind of decided it was time to become an adult. So that's why I went back to school and ended up uh, out in LA because my brother was out here. My brother is a first assistant editor on Features. Gotcha. And that that was it. It was like I want to move to LA. My brother's there. Were you right. thinking at that point you were going to work in TV or movies? Uh, I was always thinking film. And the original idea was to go to New York because I was an East Coast guy and it's New York, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I always I was one of those people like, ah, L.A., I don't want to live out there. Too much sunshine. It's too fake. <laughs> and uh, the the winter before I graduated, I came out here to visit my brother or came out to L.A. to visit my brother. And I was telling him my plans. And he goes, why would you ever want to start in the entertainment business in New York? You're going to get an apartment about the size of a closet. You're not going to know anybody. It's going to be cold. You're not going to have a car. Come out here. Sleep on my couch. It's cheaper to live here. I'll help you get a job. And uh, that was pretty much it. Yeah. He kind of he kind of just he laid it all out for me. He said, "You can go to New York, but you're going to have a much much easier time breaking in here." Yeah. And so, what was the that first job like? How, how what did you find? Uh, he actually got me a job on a movie that he was hired for. Uh, as the first assistant editor, which was uh, sold to Universal under the title of Teenage Sex Comedy You Can Make for Under $10 Million. That, that's the title of the movie? That was the working title of the movie. <laughs> the, I don't know if I saw that right, one. The, you, the title, the, the movie became American Pie. <laughs> I was actually going to guess American <laughs> Pie. And uh, it really was. It was just kind of like this little afterthought movie. And it was uh, being produced the same the same summer that Meet Joe Black, which was going to be Brad Pitt's huge first starring vehicle or his yeah. second one, and Babe 2 Pick in the City. And Universal were all in on both those movies. They thought that was going to be their summer. And we were just this little movie. And I, you know, I was working in the editing room because that's where my brother hired, hired me as the editing room PA. Okay. Uh, his soon to be wife was also working in that room. Uh, two first time directors, Paul and Chris Weitz, both of who have both of who have gone on to incredible careers. Yeah. Um, really a kind of a fun experience. And we're this little movie that was under the radar. And I'd go over to Universal maybe once or twice a week with dailies. Who knows if anybody was really watching them. Then Meet Joe Black comes out and it tanks. And then Babe 2 comes out a few weeks later and it tanks. And all of a sudden Universal starts going, that's the only movie we have left for the summer. <laughs> And, uh, so all of a sudden I went from making two or three trips over the hill to making two or three a day over the hill. They were paying more attention to the paying film. a lot more attention. And what, what were you doing as the editing room PA? Uh, you know, just picking up dailies. This, they shot it on film. This is back when, you know, you actually, so I'd had to start my day by going to deluxe and picking up the film canisters and mm-hmm. I'd have to take them over to, uh, the sound mixer and I would have to pick them up from there and, take them to wherever they were going to be showing the dailies. And then when they went into the editing room, it was the same thing. I would pick up what they had edited the day before and drive it all around. Nice. You know, it was just typical PA work. Now I was not going to say I was the oldest PA in Hollywood, but I, (laughs) but I was pretty close. I, I, you know what? I've had some older PAs in my day and actually usually they're like pretty great because it's like they, you know, they're grown ups. They know how to, they know how to work. They know how to, you know, like, behave themselves you know right. not get too much trouble so yeah I, I don't think that's a bad thing starting later and you know and and starting as a pa even if you're old if someone's listening they're like ah it's too old to start like no it's no, not it was the same experience i had in college because i you know i went back to school when i was 28 and what i found out i had already sown my wild oats i wasn't there to get laid i wasn't there to get, go to a keg party i was there to, to learn something and i was paying for it and i was actually interested in what what they were teaching me. Right. The other thing is the professors, like you said, I was a little closer in age to them. And so they under, they, they, you know, they saw me 
enjoying it. They saw me really absorbing it. And so they really kind of took a, took a liking to me as well. Yeah. So it was that same idea. You know, there, there is something really good about starting a little later in life. Yeah. And so where did you go from there? Were you thinking at that point, you're like, all right, I'm going to work in movies. Well, it was funny because I didn't like the pace of the editing room. Like I found it really slow. Maybe I, maybe I have a little ADD. I don't know. Um, suits my brother. Never didn't really suit me. But I thought, you know, let's kind of see where this this takes me. Problem is, I couldn't find a job for a while. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I was out of work for about six or seven months, actually. Oh wow. Um, you know, hard, tough to find PA work, especially if you've only done one movie and it was a small one because right. you didn't you, you didn't. Uh, get to know a huge circle of people. And I'm guessing, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's probably also to har- it's harder to find a PA job in film because there's less of those jobs available and yes. the and the people that are working in those jobs are like holding on to them with dear life because they want to work in film, right? Absolutely. And so, you know, I just kept going out and looking looking for work, looking for work. And one day I uh somebody passed my resume along to two guys who were who had gotten a deal with Fox Television. And I went over there and they needed a, an assistant slash story editor, someone who would read the first strip, scripts that came in for him and decide whether they should be passed up. And was, was this for a, a scripted show? It, you know, I never, I, I never found out exactly what their deal was for. I think it was for, for miniseries and made for TV movies. Okay. Uh, but they just kind of described what they needed from me. And I got along with him again because I was a little bit older. I was a little closer in age to the to those guys. I might have actually been the same age as him, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact. Uh, and they all they all but intimated to me intimated to me that uh, I was going to get hired. And this was on a Friday, and they said we'll give you a call on Monday or Tuesday, and we'll get you started. Well, I got a call on Monday or Tuesday, but they told me that um, one of the higher ups decided that they had a nephew who needed to needed to have that job like nepotism in hollywood yeah Mike, it's, it's come on. shocking <laughs> uh but they the, the guys felt really really bad and so they told me they took my resume and they went to every single office in that building and dropped it off oh that's really sweet my resume ended up on the desk of two guys by the name of mark cronin and gary auerbeck um Mark, I, I know who they are, but you, yeah. you could tell <laughs> well mark cronin went on to uh to found 51 minds and um, was one of the, one of the early companies to get, to get bought out. And he was one of the first retirees. Yeah. I mean, he basically like, uh, created like celeb reality with like, uh, the surreal life, surreal life and yeah. then all the spinoffs, rock of love, flavor right. of love, all those things. Gary Auerbach went on to found go, go lucky productions. He had a piece in creating the very first hills uh the first of the uh what did they call it laguna laguna beach yeah it was laguna beach then it became the hills yes uh then it became the city and that didn't go so well right uh and then it became vanderpump rules which i work (laughs) yeah (laughs) i actually i say a lot that like vanderpump rules probably owes a lot of its dna to the hills and actually our showrunner bill langworthy he worked on every season of the hills okay um and then Oddly enough, the the Hills is being rebooted just so currently right. yeah. by the same production company uh, that does Vanderpump Rules Evolution, and the the crew that's working on the Hills is like entirely Vanderpump Rules people. Oh wow! So they took so it's a different showrunner, and then the co EP um, who actually had worked with on Vanderpump before, they they were kind of like the new people, but then everyone else from like camera to audio to segment to talent like every position on that show is Vanderpump Rules people wow. okay. for the most part yep. yeah so anyway so so you you got in with uh Mark and Gary now they were they were starting up uh at, and this is 1999 or was it yeah it was 1999 2000 they were starting up a what they called a Maxim magazine on air on FX it okay. was going to be FX's third original show it was silly <laughs> is the best way to say it. I, yeah. You know, we would offer up dating advice that would never work in a million years. With Gary and Mark, I went in and, you know, the guy said, I've got this great PA for you. He's a little bit older. Well, they looked at my resume and they saw that uh, I had done some work with a band a long, long time ago called the Afghan Wigs. Okay. And Gary and Mark had, uh, had been working at MTV before they came out to L.A. And they knew the Afghan Wigs. So... A lot of my conversation with him during that first interview was about music 
and about mutual friends, uh, people like Donal Logue, the actor Donal Logue, who is a, a good friend of, of Greg Dooley, the lead yeah. singer of the Afghan Whigs. You know, it was just one of those kind of really friendly conversations, really didn't talk about work at all. You know, I said, yeah, we're starting this silly show for men. Be fun. And that was it. And so, you know, I left the interview feeling pretty good about it. And uh, I get a call the next day from their line producer offering me an associate producer job. And I'm like, whoa, wow. Nice. You know, went in for a PA. I'm going to be an AP. Nice. You reverse those initials. <laughs> yeah. Went from PA to AP. <laughs> like, wow, this is great. <laughs> Uh, so my first role on the show was, uh, I was in charge of, of procuring product placement, you know, uh, cause we wanted to feature the very first plasma screens and we wanted to give away cool men prizes, right? you know, like Ray-Ban sunglasses and things like that. And I was put in charge of the Friday clip show. So we would produce, uh, host standups on a Thursday afternoon after taping the Thursday show mm -hmm. to introduce all the clips that we were going to put in there. And so that's what I did for the first year. Nice. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, some really great people working on that staff. Uh, Jenny Daly was one of the, the, uh, the show producers at the time. Uh, she uh, recently just sold her company, but she is the founder of T Group. Oh, yeah. A uh, huge production company. Yeah. Uh, KP Anderson was a writer on that staff. KP was, is, was the executive producer and head writer for all the soup incarnations love the soup um you know just a, a, a bunch of really talented young hungry people on that staff this is a theme i i want to just comment on a couple of things about this this is a theme that is just so recurring and everyone that i talk to is that you know a lot of times the people that you meet in those early jobs when you're the pa or the ap or whatever that group of people that you sort of you know make contacts with and become friendly with they those people all go on to do big things yeah. and you know you stay in touch with those people and like a lot of that is like kind of how you grow your career along right. with other people and those contacts become very useful the, uh, the other thing that I, I like is that you know you didn't get the job because you were you know you had the best resume or that you had the most experience you'd put something on your resume like oh you worked with a band and that like sparked their interest yeah. I always whenever I'm interviewing people that come to work uh, with us, I always am looking for, you know, interesting tidbits or like, you know, fun little experiences or hobbies yeah. or so. So I personally, I think that those types of things are important to put on your resume because right. it can spark that conversation that makes you more memorable than like the other 10 people they might have interviewed or whatever. Absolutely. Um, but anyway, so so you worked on this Maxim show for a year. Well, it was it wasn't officially a Maxim show. It was like it was the it was the, the Maxim magazine, but we always. Did the quote marks the from, quote. from the Oh, Maxim. what what was the name of it? Do you remember? It was called the X Show. The X Show. And we actually taped right next door to the Man Show. The Man Show. Oh yeah, we, with Adam Carolla and, and Jimmy, Jimmy Kimmel. Kimmel. I love that. Yeah. I worked on a show that was like in the same ilk uh, for Super Delicious. One of my mm -hmm. first shows right. called Mansers. Oh, I remember uh, Mansers. Yeah, which was on Spike, and yep. it was just like cheesy narration like how many strippers does it take to change a light bulb and we do all these like dumb like reenactments and stuff but so we all we all have the cheesy man show in our history mike well what's what's really funny about that is spike of course for a long time sharon levy was the executive in charge of all television production for spike mm -hmm. she uh used to work at stone stanley that produced the man show and was dating Gary Auerbach at the time that we started. <laughs> so that I can see why Mansers and, and you know, how Spike kind of. Right, got, right. It was it was in her DNA. Already. Yeah, it was, it was right there. <laughs> um, but on the X show was a, I, I became good friends with a, a writer by the name of John Moore. Uh, John actually is one of the show producers. He's now he, he's gone on to writing. John was instrumental on in getting me into challenge producing, but it, he did it inadvertently. He had no idea why. Uh, on the X show, w once a week, we would have these segments where we created these stupid games. And one of the games I created was called Match the Model to the Magazine, <laughs> where we had a Playboy Playmate, a penthouse pet, a uh, hustler, I think they call them beavers, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, we, had, we had a sponsorship with a magazine at the time called Perfect Ten, which was trying to be the new Playboy. And then we'd bring in like a kindergarten teacher or a tennis player. And the idea was you dressed them up into similar outfits and you put them on a podium and the contestant would have to figure out which woman went with which magazine and which one was, <laughs> was the ringer. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> perfect, perfect for the action. You know, yeah. Um, and I, and I only tell you that because uh, after after I left the X show and John uh, moved on as well, he moved on to Big Brother. Uh, he got hired to be one of the show producers for season two. Now, if you go back to the history of Big Brother, season one was very much like the European editions, which was just put a bunch of people in a house and put a camera on it. It was like Survivor inside a house. Yeah. Um, there was no no games, no accoutrement you know they had to kill chickens and the audience got to vote the contestants yes. out the, the, not to like reference my podcast too much yeah. but doug ross also he owns evolution mm -hmm. he was the second episode of this podcast that i did he he was the production company for right. season one of big brother okay. and he told the whole story which is like fascinating uh how how he got the show from end of all and then right. how they ultimately like screwed him out of the show right. uh, and gave it to they, uh, I mean became, started producing it themselves in right. season two well actually they gave it to Shapiro Grodner okay and then Shapiro Grodner became fly on the wall when when Arnold Shapiro left and Rich Meehan uh, started working with Allison but uh, but yes yeah, so but if you want it yeah so if you want to hear the whole story of Big back. Brother go listen yeah. to Doug Ross's episode it is it is really interesting um, it's so did you, is that you ended up on Big Brother well uh, season two, uh, about a quarter of the way through the season, they s decided to start putting in some games, very simple things. And they took their head writer and their art director, and that was it. And they would do these games where they painted a, a flight of steps, you know, different colors. And they called it Step Up, Step Down. If you answered a question correctly, you took a step up. If you answered it incorrectly, you took a step down or stood in your place. And the first person to the top would win. And they're all, all the games are very simple like that. And it turned out to be a big hit. Uh, so after season two, CBS decided they wanted to do a celebrity edition mm -hmm. of the show. And John had, my friend John had worked on season two and said, hey, I've got a guy I'd like to bring in to be in the story department. And so, great, set up the interview. Now, at this point, um, I had been out of work for a little while from the X show. It had been a few months. And I really needed a job. And the day of the interview, I woke up and I was really sick. I probably, had, probably had like 102, 103 oh. temperature. Just, you know, feeling horrible. And I really should have canceled the, the interview. But I also knew if you, if you don't show up for the interview, the next guy is going to get the job. Right. So, you know, I took, I took as much flu medicine as I could and hand sanitized up. And I went to the interview. But I was, I was in outer space. And I sat down, and it was, John was in the room, Allison Grodner was in the room, and there was one other producer whose name I can't remember. And they started firing off questions about stories. Now, John had prepped me. Like, here's what you say. Here's, you know, mm -hmm. this, this is how we're going to get you this job. Couldn't remember any of it. <laughs> I was just flying on, on cold medicine. And I kept babbling about this silly game I created for the X show. <laughs> called Match the Model to the Magazine. And I kept explaining how it worked. And they laughed and they were listening and I'm just going on and on and on. And the interview ends and I get up and I was like, oh, I don't want, I'm sick. Can't shake your hand. They're like, we understand. Uh, walked out. Half hour later, I get a phone call saying, they loved you. They want you to come work on the show. And it was like, really? He goes, yeah, but they want you to work in something called the games department. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but sure. Yeah. Sounds great. Got a job. So went in, did uh, a bunch of pre-production for this Big Brother celebrity version until Les Moonves decided to pull the plug on it. And the reason why he pulled the plug on it is because the level of celebrities that they were getting at the time didn't meet his standards for CBS. Right. I think in his mind, he was thinking Ray Romano, mm -hmm. you know, um, that type of that type of person. Uh, what he was getting was Dana, Danny Bonaducci, <laughs> yeah. which, of course, worked really well on Surreal Life, right. but wasn't going to work, work well on the Tiffany Network. Right. <laughs> so they shut down. They shut, shut it down like two days before production was going to start. They'd, no more Big Brother. But the great thing that came out, out of that was Allison Grodner came to me and said, you've got a job on season three. When we come a regular Big summer. Brother, not yeah. celebrity version. Regular Big Brother. So that was great. You know, I knew I had employment in the summer and I was looking forward to it. In the meantime, my friend John again had gotten a job writing on a show two friends of his had sold uh, called 
the Joe Schmo show. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that? I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so he got me in as one of the challenge producers on that show. Uh, Joe Schmo, by the way, was written by Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, who, uh, for anybody who doesn't recognize those names, are the guys that wrote Deadpool. Oh, no shit. Uh, um, among many, many other things, but that's, Dead, that's Deadpool hilarious. is their big one. Uh, really great guys, great concept for a show, uh, and got to work alongside of another really talented young producer in the challenge department by the name of Heath Lumen. Hmm. Heath, uh, Heath is now the guy at Big Brother and a whole bunch of other shows. And Heath actually plays into the ATS origin story. Okay. A little, a little It all further. dovetails eventually. It all, it all, you know, it really does. It all comes <laughs> together. Uh, so Joe Schmo show was great because you, you, this was a scripted reality competition show. There was only one guy, Joe Schmo. That who, didn't know he was, he, he was being punked. Being punked. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I really, really loved that show. Like I watched it. I think when it came out, I was working in development at the time and I, I got a hold of some like VHS copies or so, something like that. And I, I would watch it in my cubicle and I just like binge watched it. I'm like, this is the funniest shit ever. It, like it's, it is it really, really funny. Really well written, really well done. Uh, really great cast. Um, I, I can't, I'm, the name's escaping me at the moment, but some really talented people went through that cast. Uh, and, and, you know, you were always reacting. You know, it's almost it's actually harder to script out these things than it is to just present a game and let it let it play, mm -hmm. you know, because you had to be prepared for any outcome. One of the challenges that I was in charge of was the typical reality show eating challenge. And so we called it the dinner party from hell. And I hired a chef uh, to come in and we created these dishes uh, like one of them was supposed to be a wombat stomach, which was really like a Japanese eggplant, which is a shriveled purple thing <laughs> with a miso sauce over it. Um, the other one was, uh, what was it? It was like a sheep's eyeball. So what we did was we took a lychee nut and we put a grape in it. So it was sticking out. We put it into a sausage skin <laughs> and then squirted like a little raspberry juice in there. So it looked like veins. And we put that on the plate with the eyeball looking forward. And we told all the actors ahead of time, you know, this is what you're going to be eating. Right. You're not eating an eyeball. You're eating a leaching. It's going to taste terrible, but it's all food. The piece to resistance, what we're going to serve to Joe Schmo, however, was going to be a plate of fake dog shit. <laughs> and this, this was our proudest creation. Like the chef and I worked, we had so many different iterations of this. We ended up using a mixture of liverwurst, uh, a little bit of brown food coloring. Uh, we even put corn in there, and my you know, <laughs> dog would have corn in there. You know, who knows? And then there was a, uh, a joke shop called Spencer's in all the malls. Yeah. I don't know if they still exist. I remember it. They used to sell these things called Liquid Stink. Oh, it's just God. this little little vial, and you get and a whole bunch of different smells you could have. And one of them, of course, was dog shit smell. And so uh, everything was served under a dome. So... You know, the plates went out around the table and the actors did their thing. They ate the, 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 the wombat stomach and the sheep's eyeball and the reactions. And then finally you get to, of course, Joe Schmo. He's going to be the last one served. And right before the plate goes out, I open up the dome. I crack the bottle open. I spray the, spray the stuff in and close the dome real quick. Plate goes out, goes in front of him. And he opens it up and you get this great reaction. Because you, 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 you see him smell it, you see him look at it. Now, when they aired the show, they let everybody in on the secret. Everybody knew that this guy was getting punked. And how they went in and out of certain segments is they would have him in a sit-down interview. And they would ask him for his reaction to what was going on in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so they pulled the dome off the plate of fake dog shit. You get this great reaction shot. And they cut to his interview. And the interviewer goes, so did you think it was real? And he goes, well, at first I didn't, but then I looked up and there, the producer, Mike, was standing there and he was just like, and I was just shrugging, saying like, yeah, of course it's real. <laughs> and he goes, that's when, I, that's when I knew it was real. <laughs> so now the, the writers had prepared for what would happen next. If he tried to eat it, the guy to his right would slap the, the fork out of his hand. Um, if he refused, which he did, 
Then they had a guy come in in a suit who was the show's lawyer, and they took him to a room that only had like a like a, a surveillance cam in it. And they sat down and they talked to him about how he was breaking his contract by not. <laughs> it was it was absolutely hilarious. The upshot of that though was that the day after it aired, I got ten calls for work. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, She's like, hey, I heard Joe Schmo mention you on the air. Uh, you want to come work for us? So I can honestly say that, uh, and I said this in every interview since then, my career was pretty much built on a plate of fake shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> That's awesome. It, it was great. And they, it did, they did a DVD and they did a whole extra segment on it. And, they, they, and all they wanted to talk to me about was like how we created the fake talk shit. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was pretty fun. That's awesome. So let's, tell me just what is a challenge producer? Right. Because, I mean, you're, you know, uh, every reality show most, or most like network reality shows, competition shows, they have these huge stunts and games. So it's not it's not just the producers that are doing this, that are handling the talent and doing story and stuff like there's a separate department of people like yourself that are coming up with all those games. Is that yeah. what it is? Well, it was really born out of two shows, Big Brother and Survivor. Um, at first, nobody knew that you needed someone just in charge of those things. Uh, like I said earlier, Big Brother didn't really have games on it until halfway through a season. Uh, with Survivor, there were always challenges involved, at least in the American version, because again, when the show came over from Europe, it had to have an, an American spin to it. Mm -hmm. And they quickly realized in season one, and same with The Amazing Race, actually. Now that I think about it, season one, they didn't have a de dedicated person for the challenges. Um, just re regular producers, story producers, uh, show producers, trying to produce these things, which meant that not only did you have to pay attention to everything you mentioned, the story, production, all of that, but you also had to make sure that the game was being played correctly, that everything was set up right, that uh, all the rules were being followed. Um, and it quickly started taking up a lot of people's time. Yeah. And so this role was kind of born out of it. Hiring somebody whose main focus was just going to be the challenges that worked within, within the show. Um, so, you know, from conception of the challenge through prototyping um, to working with the art department on getting everything built to writing rules that would have to pass uh, network legal uh, to actually producing these things in the field. And that was the sole focus of the job. And all of these shows started with just one or two. And quickly, the, as the challenges got bigger and the budgets got a little bit bigger, so did the challenge departments. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's probably the most creative, fun job within a reality competition show. Yeah, because it's it, – you're – creating games creating mm -hmm. stunts obstacles like all yeah. that like it's i mean it it sounds really fun uh, <laughs> I've, I've never done it i've done it on a very you know small level like say for like a food show be like oh what, what's the what are the challenges for this episode or you know something right. like that but like never like to the level that you're talking it sounds like it would be a real it would be a blast actually yeah it, it, it truly is i mean you know there i always say that there are no there were no stupid ideas there are plenty of stupid ideas <laughs> but even even in in the throwaway idea that somebody threw out from across the table, you might pull a little piece out of it, and you could build an entire challenge just on that little piece. Yeah. So you know you could walk in, you could walk in with any idea you had, and we may laugh. You you may get laughed at, but there might be something there that you could build a whole a whole act out of for a show. Yeah. Um, the key to it is coming up with not only a challenge that feels fresh and new, but most importantly, you're serving the needs of story. That's the most important thing in a reality competition show. The, the, the story doesn't drive the challenge. The challenge drives the story. Uh, Big Brother is a really great example of it. Um, you know, you compete to become head of household on Big Brother. Mm -hmm. With... At, but once you become a head of household, you've got all these powers that you get to play with, and you can affect all this change within the house. Same with the veto competitions. So it's not a question of story, you know, 
driving the challenge, you need to come up with something that'll help the producers build what happens after that challenge. Right. Um, and, uh, but more important, the other side of that coin is you also have to be extremely fair. Um, you can't play favorites. Uh, there are producers who have come in the passing. I'd like to try and see this outcome. And you're like, well, we can, we can hope for that outcome. Right. But if it, you know, once the game is going, it's going and we can't, we can't stop it. We can't push it. We can't tilt it because there is money on the line. And the, um, these shows do fall under game show rules. So there's like network standards and practices yes. that have to vet it and monitor it on set. I'm yep. assuming to make sure that it's not being, you know, the 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 fingers not being put on the scale for one particular cast member because the yep. producer thinks they give better interview bites or something like that. It has to be a fair challenge. Yep. Absolutely. Um. So what? So yeah, and you've worked on like a ton of shows and a ton yep. of big shows. So where did it like? It was it after Joe Schmo that it kind of like blossomed and you just you. Cr- created a career out of this yeah so um after joe schmo i went right into big brother three and that is really what kind of kind of took off from there because big brother three was when challenges on that show became big that's when you know you started transforming the entire backyard into these different sets and they started taking up a little more little more time on the show at the same time survivors exploding Mm mm-hmm uh, and there's a very brilliant guy, probably the dean of all challenge producers by the name of John Kierhofer. Been there since since Survivor won. Mm-hmm. Still there right now, guiding their challenges. Oh, and wow. He's, he's really a, the, the, the pinnacle of... Yeah, those challenges are very elaborate. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and so everybody wanted these type of challenges in their shows. But there were only a few of us who had been working in the very beginning. The OG challenge producers. Yeah. So as 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 the, the you know more and more of these shows were getting produced, we were getting the calls for them. Yeah. Um, I went. I did uh, Big Brother, and then I went to Hell's Kitchen in between the seasons. So I did Hell's Kitchen seasons one through five. Also during that time, um, I made my way over to The Amazing Race. Yeah. Um, what season did you start on The Amazing Race? I started at The Amazing Race season five as something called a pit stop producer. Uh-huh. Now, uh, my boss at Big Brother season four was a guy named Jim Buss, who was also the only challenge producer on Amazing Race. And he had decided that season five was going to be his last. And he wanted to, um, he wanted to have someone in place. And he said the best way to get over to race is to do another job let them get to know you, and then when I tell them I'm not coming back, I can recommend you. And they go, oh, yeah, we, li- we know Mike. He's great. Let's put him right in there. Mm-hmm. So he got me this job uh, as pit stop producer. And what that is, at the end of each race, you get to get to fill in the mat, and every team checks in, and then they eliminate a team. And then the entire production moves on to the next location, except for the contestants and the camera crews. Your job is to produce that final segment at the end of the show, take care of the cast and the crew during the layover and then produce the opening segment of the show, getting everybody started and back out on the next leg of the race. Right. Uh, so I did that for one season. Um, at the end, Jim made his announcement and they decided to go with someone else for the <laughs> challenge producing job. So I went back to big brother and I did season five. Great season. Had a lot of fun. Um, you know, got to work again, worked with a really talented team of people, all who have gone on to do do really cool things. Yeah. And then uh, season seven race, they decided they were going to bring on a second challenge producer. And so they asked me to come back and I was with them from season seven all the way through season 23. Wow. Um, That's a lot of seasons yeah. of television. Yes. We did two a year. Um, the but the, couldn't find a more fun job to to do challenges on yeah and it was really incredible and i'm i i love that show um i haven't watched every season it's a lot it's a big commitment of time but like i think it's brilliant and it's every time i tune in it's a blast Could, j- will you just explain like the like the process of what you did and kind of the timeline of like 
you know, your pre-pro to right. your travel and kind of like just what you would do as a challenge producer on Amazing Race? Right. So f- with a, with Amazing Race, uh, as you can imagine, it's a very, very expensive show to do. Mm-hmm. And th- it's expensive right from the very beginning. So the only people that go out on the initial scouts, well, let me take a step back. Uh, Bertram Van Munster is the creator of the show. Yeah. He's also the showrunner. Uh, he was started as a cameraman, uh, camera slash producer. He did uh, nature documentaries. He did commercials. He did a all, he had a really incredible career, and then he he got in with cops, uh, season one, mm-hmm. and he was one of the lead camera guys. Now a camera guy on cops is basically the producer. You're the second. You're the second person through the door. Okay, you're right behind, and you have to quickly find the story in that room. Yeah, as the cameraman. Because the, the police officer is doing his job. Your job is to find what's interesting. Is is the police officer moving towards the kitchen, but maybe there's someone on the couch to the right that's really the main focus. What that, he kind of created that style, that kind of idea that the camera, camera leads. And that's what you see on The Amazing Race. So um, he is involved in every aspect of it. And he, he knows what he wants to see. He's a bit of a mad genius. Mm -hmm. Um, So he would come up with a route and he would say, I want to go to, I want to go to these places in this order. And then a team of researchers would sit down and see if it was all feasible. Uh, Can, can you string it all together? And they'd work on that. In the meantime, other researchers would be coming up with little uh, things for him to look at when he went out and scouted. And so he would he would go out with a with a packet of things people thought were interesting in that location. So Bert would come back with all of these interesting things he had seen while he was out scouting the route. And he would come back with with challenges in a few different iterations. Sometimes he would have a fully formed challenge. I want to see this, this and this. And it was your job to figure out how to make that happen for him. Other times he would come back with, I want to see camels. And that was it. (laughs) So you would create a challenge that involved camels. Right. And so we would, we would, we'd go back and we'd look at research on the location in the country. And then we do research on camels that were indigenous to that area. And we would come up with a few different ideas and we'd present them to Bert. And he would either say yes or no. And he just did it like that. The third thing that might happen is he would come back with an idea for some one reason or another, it wouldn't get approved by the network, or uh, he might decide he didn't want to do it anymore, in which case you had to come up with something completely from scratch. Um, sometimes it was easier to come up with something from scratch than to take his fully formed ideas <laughs> sure. and turn them into reality. <laughs> um, and there were times when he would he would come back with something and, you know, he would say, I want to do this here. And he'd be like, that's impossible. That can't be done, Bert. And he goes, no, it can be done. Like, Bert, I'm telling you, nobody, nobody's ever done that. And you, you know, I want to see it. And so you would just, you'd work and you'd bang your head against the desk and you would, you would scream and you would come up with something. And then it all would all come together and go, oh my God, the guy's a genius. Yeah. He saw it. He knew he knew it would all come together. That's fun. So you'd have the route planned out. Yep. You know uh, how many contestants you'd have at yes. each stop, so you'd tailor the the challenge in right. each you know episode or each stop for how many people were going to be there. Yep. Uh, and it's all, but it's all on paper, right? It's well, it, like I said, they they've gone out and scouted it. You have pictures, you have location research, but yes, it's all it's all theoretical at that point. Then you start testing whatever you can in L.A. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes there's no way you can recreate a situation. Uh, Like maybe hard to find like camels to ride through a desert in Los Angeles. Or, you know, (laughs) delivering delivering tea to an office building in India, which (laughs) is not like an office building here. Or at least it wasn't, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, But you would do the best you can. And then. When the producers went back into the country a few weeks before production, that's when the real testing would get done. Mm-hmm. But again, it was being done remotely because the challenge producers, there were two of us when I started, there were three when I ended. 
just you couldn't afford to send them there and you couldn't afford to they we couldn't afford we couldn't be everywhere at once um, what's interesting about race what separates race from every other challenge show is that every location you have to have anywhere from three to five challenges up and running concurrently with you know there are no breaks on survivor big brother if something goes wrong uh you can yell cut and everybody can stand down right very easy to do the amazing race is an actual race uh, you can't stop it or anything so you have to have every single challenge location ready to go from the moment the contestants hit the ground hit the airport to the moment the last contestant gets through that final challenge right because you're you're not in control of when they arrive there, right. in what order they arrive there, yes. everything. So it just has to be ready to go. Yeah. Now that's interesting. So you weren't actually traveling to the countries. Not not during pre production. Okay. During production, yes. Okay. We went we went everywhere. Would you just follow the the cast essentially? We were, we were actually ahead of the cast. Okay. Um trying not I can't I don't want to reveal too much because you know Yeah, of course. Bert Bert always gets very upset. Uh you know if you I mean, it's a, it is like a, a magic trick that show. Yes. and so I, I totally, yeah. I, I totally understand that you wouldn't want to reveal. You know, magician never reveals a secret. Right. But uh, you know, there are there are things that are out there now, and one of the things is that the you had people leapfrogging all over the world um, on any given given day when a race is going on. You could have two thousand people working, wow. whether you're in the location where the cast is coming from location they're in and then the next two locations where they're going to be hitting yeah um so you've got all these different producing teams leapfrogging each other and then you have what they call the executive team and don't necessarily follow the cast we're actually ahead of them so at the end of a show the executive team which was the executive producers network representative legal uh host crew phil and his crew and uh, whatever producers were moving on to the next location and the challenge producers would go to the airport, usually fly overnight, get out of the airport in the morning. And then the day before a race episode was filmed, you would do a complete run through of that show. So you would get in the car at the airport. You would go to location one, two, three and four. You would see full game tests and then you would go back to the hotel and you would go into something called clue copy. Now, the clues are, you know, as you know, on race, you rip a clue, and that's how the contestants get from point A to point B. Right. That's the only instruction they get from production at all when they're out there. It's what's written in those envelopes. So those, clue co- those clues had to be absolutely accurate. They were the rules for the challenges. They, they not only explained the challenges, but they were the absolute Bible, the rules that they had to follow. Yeah. So every word had to be, you know, really poured over. Make sure that what you were saying was very clear, very concise, and easy to follow. And so these clue copy meetings could go on for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes arguing over where to put a comma or <laughs> yeah. whether you use, use they or them, things like that. And then you would sleep for a few hours, get up, pack your bags, go out. You would work your location. Everybody was assigned to a particular location. Challenge producers would spread out to the three biggest challenges. And once the cast rolled through, you would get into your car, go to the airport and start all over again. Yeah. Just keep doing it, you know, up and down like that as you cross the world. That's so cool. I I, like people that don't work in TV. A lot of times they will, you know, when I talk to them, they're like, Oh, I, I, I would love to work on like a food network show, or I'd love to work on an HGTV show because I love design. And I'm always like, those are like often like the worst shows to work right. on because they're like the smallest budget, like, you know, bad hours, whatever. But like the amazing race, I feel like has to be the show. It's like, I would love to work on amazing race. Like it, it, and it lives up to like its reputation. Right. It's, it's, I'm sure it's a ton of work, but like you're in like the coolest places creating right. this amazing game. I mean, you stayed for tw- what, 20 seasons or something. Uh, I was there 17 seasons. Yeah. So it must, it must have been fun. Uh, no, it's 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 an absolute thrill. It is the hard. It, no disrespect to any other other show I've ever worked on, but it was simply the hardest, the hardest work I've ever done. Yeah, uh, and the most rewarding. Yeah, I mean, it, the funny thing is, is after your 
midway through your very first race and it happens to almost everybody you want to quit <laughs> you you don't you you can't the, the pace is you know it's too hard people are screaming you know it's just it, it's almost impossible and you just feel like there's no way that you're going to be able to to make it through an entire season and it, it just it's horrible by the end of that first season you can't wait to do it again it doesn't matter if you haven't slept in three weeks you know your, your clothes stink you're you know, you just can't wait to get back out on the road and do it again. Yeah. And you, you won Emmys for that show, right? I was lucky enough to win two Emmys. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like especially in in reality where, uh, you know, we're not as well served by the Emmys as, mm -hmm. you know, scripted is uh, there's just fewer categories and stuff mm -hmm. like to be on a show that wins an Emmy. I think it's such a it's it's so great. It's such an honor. It was it was it was an absolute thrill. Um What's funny is the, the the category is competition reality television, yet there is no, they don't recognize the title challenge producer mm -hmm. on it, and so I had I had reached the supervising producer level, um, still in charge of challenges. That was my that was my focus, but they took the challenge out of it. And once that happened, I was I was put on the Emmy list. So that was that was always that that little thing. I I really feel like uh, especially challenge producers are underserved in that one category. Yeah. You know, and cause there were times early on and you know, I'd be sitting with one of the other guys who worked on the show and we'd be watching the Emmy broadcast and they would show a clip from something that my friend had created yet, you know, he wasn't there to, to go across the stage and, and pick up that statue. I talk about it all the time with people mm -hmm. that I work on. Cause you know, like I work in, in docu soap, which a lot of people uh, view as this kind of like, trashy guilty pleasure but like the people that work on the show are so talented and yeah. the creativity uh that goes into building these stories and everything you know like i i do think reality is underserved and underrepresented on the, the you know the big award stages yep um I so. so i think anytime you know i know a lot of people that work on shark tank which they've won several emmys yeah. anytime that reality people can win emmys i think it's it's just yeah. it's good for it's good for our community well, you know, I was lucky. I, I got to stand on the shoulders of guys like Jim Buss and Mike O'Sullivan who were at who were at race before me doing that same job. And guys like Keith Lumen who worked alongside me at race or, um, you know, Mike DiMaggio, who is still there, you know, applying his trade. And he's been lucky enough to to be nominated and to have won, won an Emmy or two. Um, but I, I feel I was very, very blessed to have, have gotten to – to win that award. Yeah. And w so why did you ultimately decide to step away from that show? Uh, you know, after 16 seasons, um, it got to a point where I didn't feel like it's the best way to say it. I wasn't having fun anymore. Um, usually I would get the, I would get the route where we we're going and just be like so excited, get to go to a new place and I remember, I remember the last couple of seasons just not being that excited. And it, it sounds terrible. It, it, sound, it sounds very, um, uh, I'm trying to struggle to find the right word. Sounds here. like a first world problem. Yes. You're like, oh, I got to go to China <laughs> yeah, and yeah, Australia. I've, I've oh, it. God. But, but after you've done it for so long and you're working so hard and, you know, you started late in this industry, Mike, yes. you're not a spring chicken that's, anymore. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> it's totally understandable. I don't think that's something to be ashamed of. <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is, is that, you know, when you're on the road of these people and the people who work on Survivor or any other show that travels will tell you the same thing. You become a family. Yeah. And like all families, after after an extended period of time, things start to, to fracture a little bit. Yeah. You yeah. Know, sometimes you really just don't want to hang out with your cousin or your brother for 24 hours a day, seven <laughs> days a week anymore. Um, and that's that's where I kind of was. And I think people felt the same way. I, I think a lot of us there had been there for so long that um, a lot of the joy had been taken out of it. And that was the, and it, it wasn't because the show wasn't great. The creative wasn't there, that the roots weren't exciting. It's just when you do something for too long. It just becomes a job. And that's yeah. what it was. It became a job for me. Um, there, And at the time, I had thought, well, maybe I want to be a showrunner someday. So I figured it was time to kind of step step off of race and move on to other shows. The other thing, um, and you might have experienced this working on Vanderpump, is that when you stay on the same show for an extended period of time, 
people stop calling you for jobs because they just kind of figure, well, you know, Mike's on race. Right. Jeremiah's on Vanderpump. He, he's not available. And so whereas you might have been getting a bunch of calls early on, then a trickle, then after a while, they just kind of stop. Mm -hmm. And you, you start thinking, OK, what happens if I if the show ends? What do I do now? Yeah, no, I, I, I think about that all the time. I talk about it with people all the time. It's kind of a, a blessing and a curse to yep. end up on on the same show at the same company. Or the, the other thing that happened is if you end up, even not the same show, just in the same company. So right. you say you're just like, you know, I've been, it, so four years ago, uh, five years ago, I, I would fill my year with three, four, five, six different shows at at six different production companies. And since I got in it on Vanderpump uh, in the last three to four years, like I really have been at Evolution. And I haven't worked at another company. And I, I love Evolution. I love Vanderpump Rules. But I do sometimes think like, well, when this teat runs dry, right. like I'm going to be I'm going to be in a, a different position than I was, you know, back in back in the day when I was so used to just like bouncing around. I had a ton of contacts, yep. you know, and it's also as you get uh, higher up in the world of production, the jobs become fewer uh, because, you know, there's only one showrunner right. on a show, whereas there's maybe six story producers or four field producers or whatever. So it's all, you know, that's another thing to consider. Absolutely. And I, I that, you know, that was a lot of it. Um, having started at kind of the beginning of this genre of television, um, I was competing against, you know, a lot of my friends for jobs and, um, you know, only like you said, only one person's going to get get that top job, whether mm -hmm. it be showrunner or head of a challenge department or this other or the other. Um, yeah, so it, you know, it, it was time to kind of step off, try something, try something different. I stayed in challenges, um, but I wanted to make the move into executive producing, and um, I was able to do it. Um, I was co EP on what were the shows I was co EP on. Uh, I went directly into the baking show mm -hmm. uh where i was supervising producer it was with cbs's version the great was it of, the great baking it great was, bake off it, it was called the american american baking champion i can't remember what we although it. i i think i watched that one it was the one it was like in like georgia. a giant tent in georgia, yes, in georgia in the middle of the woods yeah. or something it was it it, it was a, it was the american it was the first american version of the great british bake off right which is, right, right which is a huge hit and there were uh, there were so many mistakes made on that show, um, but it was it, it was a lot of fun. It was interesting to do. Uh, it was fun to go back into culinary a little bit after after being away from it for so many years. Um, after working on Hell's Kitchen, mm -hmm. um, fortunately the show didn't come back. Uh, I went on. I was co EP on a show on Spike, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. and I, all full circle. It all comes back to goofy man back. shows. Uh, that's right. <laughs> with uh, with with two of the nicest guys in the business, uh, the guys who run Mission Control Media, and they're the company that does uh, Hollywood Game Night. Uh, they also did Face Off, which I thought was one of the most brilliant competition. Was that the, shows. the the makeup competition? Yeah, show? It was the, yeah. It was the it was the Hollywood uh, special effects yeah. makeup design. Yeah, that show. was a cool show. Um, and it you know that. That and RuPaul's Drag Race, I always thought, were two of the most well done reality competition shows on television. For years and years, they never they never even got nominated in the category when they should have been. Now, this past year, RuPaul's Drag Race actually won, I believe. Yeah, they RuPaul's yeah. finally been getting some like like big time recognition, I think, and but, they, but like didn't happen for years. Yeah, many many years. And you talk to anybody who worked in the in competition reality television, and you asked them what their favorite shows were. Usually it was RuPaul's Drag Race and then mm -hmm. Face Off. And what, what was great about uh, Face Off, and they brought that same attitude to Framework, which is the, the, the furniture competition show that I co-EP'd for them on, was they're the type of guys who don't try to gin up the story or the drama. They, they figure they're going to find great personalities in casting and just the, the pressure of the competition is going to is going to make that story blossom. Right. And I, th I think they did a really brilliant job of it. So when did you transition into this new job? Or I guess it's not that new anymore, but, um, so ATS, uh, which, which stands for Alpine training services started as a Kenyan company. They're the company that 
uh, race used to hire to do what we called the big wow events, the big stunts. Anytime you saw someone climbing up the side of a building or swinging across a gorge, they would call ATS. So you were hiring the company. Yes. They were like your vendor. Yep. And then how did the tables get turned and how did you become their employee? The way I got in is Travis, Travis, one of the owners and I have remained very close friends throughout my career. We got to know each other very well when we were working together on Amazing Race, when we would come in and work with us. And then when I would do other other shows, smaller shows, um, I, my first call was always to ATS. You know, I did a show called Summer Camp on USA Network, and uh, Travis, Travis and the guys provided all of our challenges for us. Sometimes a little out of their wheelhouse, sometimes just acting as a challenge art department. But uh, Travis's philosophy was... If he liked working with you, if you were friends, if you had done something good for, for the company, he was going to return the favor. So every one of us who used to encourage our bosses to hire ATS to, to work on our, our bigger shows, we've all been able to benefit from his generosity on the smaller shows that we worked on. That's awesome. Um, and Travis and I stayed friendly. We'd go out to dinner maybe once a month, and we'd talk about the business and how, you know, ATS was doing and how I was doing. And, you know, I, I think I started to tell him that I was getting a little, you know, I was ready to maybe step away, try something different. And he had a job here at the company that uh, the person who was in it was just about to leave. It was basically business development. He wanted somebody who would go out and represent the company and start bringing in more business. Somebody who knew, who knew the landscape of reality competition television. Yeah. And we talked about it for months and months and months. And then finally, uh, the guy who sat in this office before me decided it was time for him to leave. And I was lucky enough to come in. That's awesome. The funny enough, the last show I did as a co EP was something called the smartest guy in the room for the history channel. And our very last challenge we filmed in the warehouse here. <laughs> that's, that's kind of poetic. <laughs> yeah. We built it. We built a giant, uh, giant soapbox derby track and the guys had to design their own, their own cars for it. And then when the, when they yelled cut, I just came up to my new office. You put stuff. down your field monitor. <laughs> and that was it. It was done. <laughs> came up to your office. Yeah. Like, all right. Uh, so what do you, what do you think, Mike, for people that are, uh, younger in the business, people that are maybe hearing this and going like, holy shit, that sounds like right up my alley. I love games. I love stunts physical challenges like i could come up with those for these shows like how do people get into this weird niche job that you have well the best the best way to do it is to just identify who's working on these shows uh and send them a resume i mean the thing about the thing about a, a good head of a challenge department is they're always looking for young talent uh Sometimes ideas dry up a little bit. Sometimes, sure. Sometimes you get a little jaded. Sometimes, uh, and you kind of rely on new blood to to bring to bring in new ideas. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got in this business when I first got out to L.A., I went to visit a friend of my brother's who was at the time encouraging me to go the executive assistant route, and he said to me, "What's going to happen is you'll get a job for a guy. You're going to come up with a great idea." He's going to take that idea, he's going to call it his own, and he's going to get promoted because of that idea. But he's going to take you with him. And then you're going to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it's kind of a self-perpetuating. It's kind of a, a, kind of a bleak way, look on Hollywood, but kind of true. Well, it is and it isn't because, uh, you know, it just is about servicing the people that you work for. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a big part of how you succeed in this business. If right. you can help your boss be better at his job, he's right. going to value you and he's going to bring you up. And then at some point you're going to be the boss yep. and you're going to be relying on people under you. I, I don't mean it It to me, it, maybe because I'm in it, it doesn't sound like nefarious or anything. Right. But like, but yeah, just helping people. Yeah. It's helping people succeed, even if those are the people that are above you. Well, and, and you quickly learn that it's not your idea. It's not his idea. It's the show's idea. Totally. You know, I'm, I'm working for the amazing race. I'm, nobody's keeping a score ca scorecard of who created that challenge and who produced that challenge. You're all, you're servicing the format. Yeah. You're servicing the show. Uh, the bigger the success the show is, 
bigger success you'll be. All boats rise with a yeah. rising tide, right? Um, so, you know, if you just identify who the people are, people are that you need to send a resume to, not that hard to do. Um, that's the easy part. Uh, are people, are the challenge producers normally identified in the credit as challenge producers yes. on these shows? Yeah. So you could look up on IMDb, watch yeah. the credits at the end of your favorite show, Google those guys, and most people are pretty easily discoverable these days. Or contact the production company. Mm-hmm. Very, you know, wait till that last card flashes across the uh, the credits and when it says fly on the wall productions, you know, cold call or cold email fly on the wall productions, send yeah. them your resume. They all tell have them, websites with yeah. like their numbers and everything tell, on them. Tell them exactly what you, what you want to do. The key, however, if you want to get into the challenge department is just don't go into an interview with a good resume. Come in with some ideas. Know the show. Know the show that you're applying for. Come up with two or three ideas that you feel would work for the show. That's that, that's the key. That is su- that's such good advice. Yeah. That's really good advice. Like know the show. You know, in my world, we always ask people when we're coming in, oh, what what were your favorite storylines from last season? Or like, what character do you respond to? How would you, you know, how would you have treated this story if you were in that position or whatever? That's that is really good advice. Yeah. And that's 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 what someone like me would have been looking for. I'd want to I'd want to find out. Do you watch the show? If you don't watch, if, if you if you lie about it, you're going to get found out pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, and, you'll be pitching competition. Yeah. You're pitching challenges that were already on TV. Right. Uh, do, do challenges department? Uh, do they have PAs usually, like their own dedicated PAs? The bigger shows do, uh, but very few. Um, the Big Brothers um, Survivor has something famously called the Dream Team, mm-hmm. where it's a PA rate job. But I've never done it, but I've heard it's the most fun you'll ever have. You're basically the team that tests all the challenges. Oh, fun. And you also, you're also you also the bodies for B-roll shots. So anytime you see the helicopter shot of a bunch of people playing a game, that's the dream team. Right. And it's usually young people wanting to break in, looking for an adventure. And that's that's a real That would be, oh my God, you imagine getting that job like right out of college? Like that'd be the best job ever. Oh, they, and they have a lot of fun out there. On I'm sure they do. I've met people that uh, tested challenges for Fear Factor, PAs that would test challenges for Fear Factor. They did not refer to themselves as the dream team. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Like, will you eat this sheep anus <laughs> for one hundred and fifty dollars? <laughs> I did. I did half a season of Fear Factor too. Really, it was, it was an interesting, interesting job. <laughs> what type of person do you think uh, would excel in this sort of this challenge producing world? Like, what personality traits or like, what do you need to be good at this job? Right. Um, Having good ideas is just one one part of it. Uh, you also have to be extremely thorough. Uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, you are you are working on a game show where pri- where prize money or cash equivalent prizes are given out, and so you have to make sure that everything is meticulously fair. You have to look at it from every single uh, angle to make sure you haven't forgotten anything. Uh, because if something goes wrong during a challenge or somebody finds a way to do it to cheat basically and you haven't and you haven't thought about it now you're in a now you're in a world of trouble yeah uh, so you have to be you have to be thorough meticulous um, you have to you have to be willing to jump in and stop something if you think it's going going wrong um, especially from a safety standpoint, um, you know you can't be you can't be scared of the fact that cameras are rolling, or you might you might kill the story. If you if you feel that there's something dangerous about to happen, it's up to you to step in and, and stop it. Mm. Well, Mike, thank you. This has been really 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 cool. You have such a cool story, like really interesting uh, job amazing credits uh thank you so much for doing this well thank you all right that was mike miller what a fun guy what a great conversation he's actually moving to london by the time this show's going on the air so i'm glad that i caught him before he relocated he's going over there to run the international department of the company he works for ats team So thank you, Mike, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And thanks to you guys for listening. If you haven't already, 
please go on to iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening and subscribe, rate, or leave a review for the podcast. It is very helpful to the show. If you want to reach out to me, I'd love to hear from you guys. I have an Instagram account. It's Working Class Hollywood. Or you can email me. It's show at workingclasshollywood.com. I really would love to hear any feedback you guys have for me. We are two episodes into the podcast in 2019. I've got some great interviews that I've already recorded that will be coming up in the next few weeks. And I've got some great guests on the calendar. So keep listening, guys, and I will see you next time.